I'm Mary Ellen Cubitt, uh, our uh, moderator today for the Money Panel. I'm the producer of a humanities podcast that focuses on Southern rural voices called Arts and Letters Radio, based out of Little Rock, Arkansas. And just a few housekeeping matters before we get started. I'd like to encourage everyone in their view, if possible, to choose speaker view. I think you might enjoy that setting the best. And of course, I all want to thank Ash and give a special shout out to our technical advisor, Milan, who has been really helpful in helping us get ready for the uh, presentation today. So thank you so much. Um, our panelists today include uh, John Barber from Reimagined Radio, Marshall Poe from the New Books Network, Charles Woods from the Big Rhetorical Podcast, and uh, Chris Weber from the Archaeology Podcast Network, and of course, last but not least, Dr. Claire Hardecker from and Claire podcast. So uh, we are also imagining a lot of questions today from the audience about, as we've been saying, all things money. So we're going to start with a brief introduction by each panelist, and then we hope to get directly involved in some questions from the audience. So, um, John, do you want to start? Sure, I'll be glad to. Um, am I to introduce myself and then talk about my money? <laughs> All right. Um, as Mary Ellen has already said, my name is John Barber. I'm faculty with the Creative Media and Digital Culture Program at Washington State University, Vancouver. That's in the United States, not British Columbia. A mistake often made, especially during the Winter Olympics, when people showed up here and wanted to know where the ski hills were. Um, uh, Mary Ellen has also told you that I'm involved with a production called Reimagined Radio although it is not a officially, quote officially, a podcast, according to the definition I'm sure Marshall will offer, um, it is in the process of becoming. And in that becoming, it takes money to make it happen. And I think it's um, auspicious that I get to talk first because I get to talk about one end of the spectrum of financing for your podcasts, and that is that you pay for it yourself. Um, and that's exactly what I'm doing in, uh, in my production. Um, I just earlier today received a bill, uh, an invoice from um, the uh, sound designer, music composer, arranger that I work with, who in this case also did all the casting and directing and recording of the uh, spoken content. I'm sorry, is that a question someone's asking? No? Okay. Um, and it was over $3,000. So how I'm going to come up with that money to pay for this podcast is right now a legitimate question. But it's one that I intend to solve because this particular episode is a celebration of the most famous radio broadcast ever, The War of the Worlds. And I intend with this production to reset the standards for what would be an interpretation um, of The War of the Worlds. It's been localized here to Vancouver, Washington. We're using local voice actors, all the sound effects, sound ambiences, whatever have been redone. So $3,000 is worth I believe what I'm getting for this podcast, especially since it's coming from a three-time Emmy award-winning sound designer. But how to pay for this is, is a big question. And right now, my strategy is I'm working more at my university. I've volunteered to teach extra courses this semester, and I'm getting a course overload fee for that. That goes straight into a, a professional development budget which I've set up. So I bill invoices uh, to that budget. So it's my sweat equity that uh, ends up paying uh, for this project. That's the long and the short of it. And I'll be glad to yield the rest of my time to other speakers or questions, comments, and even opposing viewpoints. Marshall, do you wanna take it away? Sure, thanks very much, Mary Ellen. Uh, I'm Marshall Poe. and. I'm the founder of the New Books Network. I was a professor of history for many years at the University of Iowa. And in 2007, I started a podcast called New Books in History to see if I could 
get anyone to listen to people talk about their books. And it turned out that they did. And then other people from other disciplines started to contact me and they said, why isn't there new books in African-American studies? Why isn't there new books in Indian religions? Why isn't there new books in philosophy? And I didn't really have a good answer to that. So I set these podcasts up for these people and I did all the technical services for them so that they concentrate on the content. And so the New Books Network grew organically for seven or eight years, during which time I paid for everything. And I was very worried that it was not sustainable. Um, by that time, we had reached a, a, quite a large audience um, in the hundreds of thousands. And uh, this concern drove me to experiment with various business models. By the way, I quit my job as a professor to do this. And so the, uh, the need to find revenue became rather dire. Uh, so eventually, um, having experimented with all these business models, I did find a way for it to pay for itself. <clears throat> and it is currently everything. I mean, it's all I do. <clears throat> and the, the network is sustainable. Uh, that is economically, it, it is a, a viable enterprise. That means that it has enough revenue to cover its costs. But I know a lot about business models and I know a lot about uh, getting revenue and these kinds of things. And I'm, I'm happy to talk to other podcasters about it. Uh, and I look forward to the discussion. Great. Claire, do you want to go next? <clears throat> yeah, can you hear me uh, clearly? Fantastic. Um, so I am a uh, lecturer, I think the American equivalent is a professor at a university in England, Lancaster. Um, and my podcast was, it was sort of an experiment in trying to engage, uh, sort of getting ordinary people interested in the research that I do. Um, because we know that ordinary people don't really read research articles, or at least they're too high flown, they're too boring, they're very dry. So I was trying to make it really interesting and accessible. And the field I do is forensic linguistics. So it's the sort of the intersection between crime and language. So it became sort of this archive casebook of, you know, did Shakespeare really write Shakespeare? Was this a forced confession? Is this text message a, a, a threat and what have you? Um, and because it was a, effectively an experiment, the, the budget, uh, my relationship with money has consistently been that there isn't any. Um, so it's been like how, tiny of a budget can you produce a podcast on how much can you do yourself what do you really have to outsource that you just can't get away with trying to do yourself where can you cut corners um are there bits of uh, the the research process or the editing process that someone else can undertake if you've got a full-time job on the side as well is there anything that you can outsource even to someone who's not necessarily a specialist things like putting the content onto the blog or writing up transcripts um, so most of my relationship with money has been how to make your expenditure as tiny as possible. And I haven't in any way tried to turn it into an income model because um, that wasn't really my point when I started this. So the way that I approach the whole thing is, can you really minimize the outlay? And for, if you want sort of the advice, the expertise on turning it into an actual income business, then I'm sure other people on this panel are probably much better to ask. So that's my perspective. Charles. Uh, I should have my Zoom figured out after, you know, a year and a half of this, but here we are. Uh, my name is Charles uh, Wood. I'm a teaching assistant professor at East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina. And in 2018, I incorporated a nonprofit organization to raise money uh, for my podcast called The Big Rhetorical Podcast. Um, and I started that podcast to... Um, Uh, promote the work of graduate students and other scholars in uh, the field and the discipline of rhetoric, writing studies, and technical communication. Um, and then, in two years ago, I started a nonprofit, organized that, and started giving awards to graduate students after raising money. And so that's kind of what I think I can bring to the conversation today. But uh, I don't make any money like Claire. And then the other thing I would say. Is that so? I can talk about some of that business stuff. However, I might not be the best of that. And the other thing is, I produced the big rhetorical podcast Carnival. It's an annual event where podcasts from around the world come together and produce an episode on a single subject or topic. 
this year we did uh, Contending with Misinformation in the Community, and that was a success. And um, yeah, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Facebook, reach out to me if you want to join the podcast. Uh, sorry if no one else promoted themselves. I think everyone pretty much did them. So I'm excited to talk to you all today. <laughs> Chris. <laughs> Marshall's already laughing at me. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, everybody. So Chris Webster, uh, I'm in the United States, a cultural resource management archaeologist or CRM archaeologist. And I started my first podcast in 2010, just basically reading Google news stories about CRM. It was incredibly boring, the most horrific thing you could ever imagine. But I did it for a year, learned how to edit, then scrapped the whole thing and started the CRM archaeology podcast, which is really the show I always wanted. And we've had, we've got a few hosts on there, actually three, including me that have been on since 2011. We're over 200, I don't even know what we're recording this Sunday, like 250 episodes or something like that. And uh, we go every two weeks. But in 2014, I wanted to branch out from CRM as a topic. So I figured, why just start another podcast? So I started the Archaeology Podcast Network with Tristan Boyle. And as of right now, uh, just looking at our numbers this morning, we have over 3,000 episodes on the network, about a million downloads a year across all the shows. Um, we have 15 or so volunteers, some with various uh, uh, expertise and, and commitment levels, <laughs> about 20 hosts uh, for all of our shows combined. And we have an advertising manager who works on commissions. So this is largely volunteer run, and uh, we do make some money through... Uh, a membership system that we have and we make some money through advertising and then uh, very little money through like spike sales through a T public store. So um, that's how we're bringing in money and we're, you know, not totally monetized, not totally paying for everything. Cause I'm one of the sole editors, one of the primary editors, but I now have three other volunteer editors that are helping on specific shows. So it's taking some of the editing away because it's about 20, well, about 30 to 40 hours, I guess, a week of editing. Um, before all the shows on the network and we are pushing through. And in fact, if we have time later, I might mention this, but we figured, Hey, we're not quite there yet. And we're coming up on seven years. Why don't we start a new company over the top of the APN to include all kinds of podcasting, editing and production services, which I also do on the side through my other company, um, Chris Wester Productions uh, for other clients that aren't archeology, span but we're rolling all that into a big cultural media group where we're going to do all kinds of things, including other podcast networks. So I figure we have no money now. We may as well do more with no money later. So there you go. <laughs> okay, so um, we kind of uh, divided up some topics that as a panel we can all talk about. Um, one, of course, is production costs. This would include startup costs, equipment costs, production, editing, mixing costs, music licensing, as was already mentioned, platform hosting fees, transcription, website hosting, archiving, et cetera. So all of that involves money that you need to produce a uh, podcast. We could also, of course, talk about monetizing, which uh, um, some of us are new to or uh, thinking about or maybe experts in. So we could think of commercials or on the nonprofit side or public radio side, underwriting, patrons, listener support, and so forth. Um, of course, we can talk about grant funding on a state, local, federal, or private foundation level. Um, we could also talk about private individual donations. And then, of course, we could talk about the nonprofit versus for-profit model that uh, different panelists have all engaged in. So um, we are here to take it away with questions. And um, Marshall, do you want to start off uh, while we wait for some of our audience to start posting questions? Do you want to talk a little bit about monetizing, kind of maybe a little model there? Sure. As I said, the New Books Network has been around since 2007. And as I said, I've experimented with lots of different monetization schemes. Uh, we had donations at one time. I tried very hard to get alliances or deals with universities and colleges because our mission is public education, so it makes sense for them to help fund us. Uh, these were by and large tremendously unsuccessful. Uh, I, I kept working on the New Books Network and had day jobs and so on and so forth, and, and the network uh, grew to a very significant scale. Um, currently, we have over 600 hosts 
and uh, we've published 12,500 episodes wow. and we publish 75 new ones every week and about, well, we do about 2.6 million downloads a month. And uh, the only way that the New Books Network works is advertising, essentially. And we were lucky enough to get on a podcast host, Megaphone, which is currently owned by Spotify. Uh, they put ads on our podcast and then they give us a cut of the revenue. Um, we also have other income streams. In addition to advertising, we partner with university presses. Uh, we also partner with colleges and universities to mount podcasts for them. Uh, and that produces a certain amount of revenue. Uh, the NBN is a very lean organization. It has one employee, that is me, and I do all the audio editing and almost all the development and pretty much everything else. Uh, but as, essentially, you know, the thing that I, I always emphasize to, to podcasters is that you need to think about how to make your podcast sustainable. And in our world, sustainable means having revenue. And, and and this is a very serious consideration because the internet is full of really great podcasts that are no longer operating. And, and that's bad um, because they have the same public education mission that we have. So those, those episodes are lost. You know, and one of the things we do with podcasts is we host humanities podcasts on the New Books Network in order to, to defray their hosting costs. We pay for their hosting. Um, and... Uh, to make sure that their episodes are archived. That is, that they'll be permanently available forever, essentially, like a library would. So yeah, I mean, the thing that I, I emphasize to people is think, think about ways to get regular income, regular revenue, so that you can continue to do the work. Because when I started, I didn't do that. <laughs> and I suffered. Uh, but now we kind of have that figured out. Chris, did you want to add? Yeah, I'll only slightly disagree with one thing and that is that is that you need to actually have revenue i would say that's absolutely true depending on the scale of what you're trying to accomplish with you guys marshall there's no question that you couldn't do this without some sort of income right because of the level of work but if you want to start a podcast and put it out there you can start with you know minimal startup costs uh, a free hosting service and some other things and you know, just get your podcast out there, get your thoughts out on audio, and it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be amazing, and it doesn't have to be highly produced. It just has to be out there to get you started, to get you into it. And I would say the, the biggest cost to most people for startup is time, time management. You know, if your podcast releases weekly, then you need a couple of weeks ahead of time, a block on your schedule to do research, a block on your schedule to do recording, and a block on your schedule to do editing. And if you can manage the time, then you can manage a podcast, which is just you, maybe a host, and it's one show. If you're running a network, it's a completely different thing. But if you just want to get your stuff out there, I would say don't let don't let costs stop you. Let costs figure themselves out later on. You know, just get it going. That's that's the only thing I would add to that. Okay, we have our first question in chat, um, and they are asking. Uh, it looks like Avon is asking: Is there a minimum listenership? that makes it uh, worthwhile to look into advertising. So I can comment on that too. Um, I was just talking about this with somebody else the other day. It depends on your advertisers, okay? So if you're looking for Blue Apron or Netflix to advertise on your podcast, they're gonna look at a number called CPM, which is cost per thousand. Uh, I think the M is the Roman numeral M. So cost per thousand. And what they're gonna say is, okay, so we're gonna, you know, you can charge we're going to charge $8 CPM. So if you have uh, 10,000 listeners, then you can get $80 per download for that episode, right? Um, obviously, if you're looking at those numbers, you need many, many thousands of downloads to make any money. And a lot of the big name people out there that aren't related to your subject matter or your topic, like the Netflixes and the Blue Aprons and the Casper mattresses that you hear on all the big podcasts, I mean, those are those podcasts are in the hundreds of thousands of downloads, if not more, per episode, and so they're making some pretty decent money off of that. Now, if you're a podcast about cultural anthropology or something related to that, and you want you want some local group to sponsor you, I've had clients that I that I produce for get niche advertisers to actually pay them before they even start releasing episodes to agree to a contract. Their audience is literally zero. So if you look for 
those people in your group that don't know anything about CPM, they don't know anything about, you know, doing anything on a podcast advertising wise, seek those people out first. And you can almost just mm-hmm. negotiate a price that works for both of you and, and get that on the show. So yeah, just depends. Okay. We have a uh, question, slightly changing topics here about unpaid labor or interns. So uh, real quick, show of hands, do any of us use any interns on the show? Um, now this could depend also whether your podcast is affiliated with a academic institution where uh, students register for internship credit uh, per se, but uh, we're getting some questions about um, how to possibly raise money to pay for your interns, how to, or the ethics of the unpaid interns. So, um, you know, uh, Claire or Charles, do you want to talk a little bit about maybe addressing this issue about interns and whether it's ethical or unethical to pay them? Um, I'm happy to go first. Is that okay, Charles? Yeah, okay. Um, so um, I have two types of interns that work on mine. Um, as, you've, as you've mentioned, because of the university setup, we have modules where students basically do what's called a work placement module um, and they find an employer effectively. So um, I'm offered those from the university level and from a faculty level. Um, I think I had six or seven last year, which is incredibly useful. They, they're very, very good. The way that I kind of view this in my head is they are effectively getting university credit. They're getting module credit. They're going to get, they get something back from this. Um, when it comes to, for instance, um, sort of the more external internships that I do, um, I do have an absolute minimum that they have to receive payment. Um, and it ha- there has to be something in it for them and it's, it's monetary. Um, if their experience levels are generally very low, then obviously you can pitch your pay accordingly and you can effectively onboard them and train them through the process and increment their payment. But yes, I mean, Uh, Probably the most effective part of being a part of the university is that I don't necessarily have to outlay costs, but I can seek what the university has in terms of resources. The interesting thing about that, though, is that they don't just send them to me because I work there. They would if there was an external podcaster who had a, you know, a business, they would be quite happy to let that student go and do work for that podcast as well, whether it was a nonprofit or a for profit. So if you're around a university who has that kind of a system, it might be worth inquiring and saying, do you have internship schemes? Would you allow a student to do uh, work? Um, and that would be for module credit. So that's a potential avenue for um, exploration for some of you. Charles? Charles has disappeared. Yeah, he might be having some tech issues. Um, oh, there he is. <laughs> oh, there he was. There he goes. <laughs> okay, so um, he's Charles, teasing when, us. <laughs> he's just like uh, when a you can hear us, um, you just shout, and we'll we'll let you uh, take over the mic. Um, it might sometimes if you have low bandwidth, you could try turning your camera off, and we could just hear you. This is very much podcasting, by the way. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, I'm speaking over <laughs> someone now. My internet is not good, so that's why I keep keeping my my video off. Sorry. So we're talking about interns, Charles. Student <laughs> interns or general interns? Yeah, I don't have any interns, um, but I am putting out my first call for a fellow. I'm looking for a graduate student who's going to help me uh, grow the podcast and produce one episode. And I think that's a great way for a graduate student to get some field experience and stuff like that, for sure. But the thing is, like, through my nonprofit, I can pay them. And I think that, you know, in the past, we've talked about rules between, like, states that allow interns, what do you call these folks, things of that nature, which are important. So I'm actually calling on a fellowship, and I'm going to give 100 bucks, 150 bucks to make one episode of my podcast. Um, I think that this is a good way to think about making podcasts more, I don't know, scholarly, which I guess Marshall's been trying to do for, like, 15 years, but... Uh, or whatever. But yeah, that's what I'm thinking about in terms of interns, mm-hmm. navigating the muddy waters of interns versus fellows, working with graduate students. And I'm sorry, my internet is so shoddy today. John, do you want to add a little bit to the conversation about student workers or interns or internships for academic credit? Sure, I'd be happy to. I don't have interns. I don't have student workers associated with my project. I have a 
taught classes in the past where part of the class work was to be involved in a production of an episode. But at that time, my podcasts, quote podcasts, were actually originally live performances and recorded and then distributed uh, later. And I found that it was very problematic with student schedules. Uh, my campus is a commuter campus, so generally people are coming to campus only long enough to take a particular course, then they're going home to deal with their family or their job, whatever it is, and to come for rehearsals and uh, performances uh, just was so problematic that it ended up being uh, not productive. Um, other than that, I would totally agree with Charles uh, and um, and Claire as well. It's both problematic and incredibly rewarding, depending on the context of, um, in my case, uh, and perhaps yours, the university, uh, what sort of standards are in place. I firmly believe that students should not be asked to work for free. I feel that's unethical. Students at my university are graduating with a debt through their financial aid that's the equivalent of the price tag for a luxury automobile. Why should I ask them to uh, work for free uh, when they're just uh, you know, going deeper in debt? So as much as possible, um, I try if I am, I have former students, let me say it this way, I have former students that are now part of the core team of reimagined radio. One is the graphic designer produces all the graphic assets for each monthly episode um, of the project. Another takes care of uh, social media. And I am always casting around for ways to pay them monthly, pay them for their time, pay them for their effort. Um, I think this is the right thing to do. Now, uh, we do on occasion have interns at Arts and Letters Radio. We're both affiliated with universities. I work for the University of Central Arkansas. My partner works for the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, and we are partnered with our uh, Arkansas NPR affiliate, KUAR, and they do have a specific internship program. So we have worked with interns, and there is there is a lot of rules and regulations that we do follow regarding having interns, how many hours or work they week, um, and so forth. We have to follow a lot of different policies. And uh, we've had as many as four, which uh, <laughs> Claire, for us, that was too many. Um, and then uh, so we're going to keep it small, maybe one, two at the most, because what we want to keep in mind, it is a learning experience. So, you know, how, what level do you have them work? And we try and remember that it is a, a learning opportunity for these students so that they can use possibly as credentials if they are actually going on and seeking employment in the audio uh, production field. So, um, yeah, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, we did get an, ex we did get a question. Claire has something she'd like to say. Oh, Claire, please pop in. Sorry, I should have probably used the proper hand up thing. Um, I just wanted to add on that note, I noticed that you said that you had four and that was too many. When I had seven last year, that was, <laughs> I will not repeat that experience. Um, so probably the valuable thing to add is that if you do take on interns, as you've noted, it should genuinely be a valuable learning experience for them. Um, and so in a way it is in fact a lot of work for you too, because yes, you might get great research out of them, but then you need to tell them, well, how are you gonna turn this into, in my case, like a proper archived case that can turn into a narrative. Um, so it shouldn't just be, oh, you know, they spend 40 hours or whatever their contract is just editing audio. It, it should be like a two way process, hopefully. Um, because otherwise, if you're taking on an intern with the expectation that you're getting a complete audio engineer, you're gonna be very disappointed. Um, so it's just sort of having the right expectation for what you're going to get for, you know, from an intern effectively. That was it. We have a couple good points in chat. One is, yes, when we have an intern at the bottom of that episode webpage, we do list the intern's name as a, uh, a production assistant or a production intern. And um, one thing to keep in mind, we will add in the cost of paying interns into our grant applications. Um, the program that I work on is all funded by uh, grants. So um, we work with the National Endowment for the Humanities and then the Regional Arkansas Humanities Council 
for funding each year. So we apply for grants um, pretty consistently through different pockets of, of federal and state funding. So uh, we write those into the grant application itself. So just something to think about if you're thinking of working on a grant, think of adding that paid student internship in there. Um, we did get a question about uh, patron. If, has anyone used patron as a, a niche uh, listener funding opportunity? I We have not. So I have set up Patreon accounts. We ended up going with actually our, uh, the, the APN is built on a Squarespace website and there's a company called Memberspace that basically will lay on top of a Squarespace website and help you create a membership system and lock certain pages down for members only. We ended up going that route only because it seemed more affordable. Their, their pricing structure was more based on jumping up levels, kind of like MailChimp does, whereas Patreon was taking a cut of every single donation. And, but that being said, my biggest comment here is if you have any sort of membership-based service, no matter how you're doing it, don't overcommit on what you're offering. Because I see so many podcasts out there, they're like, oh, at X number of dollars a month, we'll send you a personalized written letter every month. And what happens if you get a thousand people at that level? Like that's all you're going to be doing. <laughs> so you have to think, think positively and think scalability and don't mail people things. Don't commit to things like that. Don't even say, you know, we'll mention you in every podcast, because again, you need to think scalability. Um, you might want to thank your new patrons that week or something like that. That's a, that's a smaller number. But when we we had three different levels on the APN where I was sending people at the at the annual highest level, this whole swag package, and I ended up getting people from Canada and Australia all the time. And it cost me like $100 to mail them a package of, you know, $50 worth of stuff on their $180 membership. So, you know, it's, um, it's just don't overcommit on the stuff that you're going to send people. We ended up coming down to, I think we're at $7.99 a month and we're expanding all these services in January. But guess what? We are not increasing our prices. We are offering way more live events, way more back catalog stuff, way more things for our members, but we're going on kind of the Netflix model. If they can be a billion dollar company at $8 a month, I feel like I'll take a fraction of that at $8 a month and just count on uh, building our listenership and our, and our, uh, our subscriber base. So yeah, just don't overcommit on hard, hard things to send them. <laughs> a, um, a new good question came up in chat about grant writing and funding. Is there specific grants for podcasting? I don't know of any. So then the question follow up, is it a general humanities grant? So yes, we apply for public humanities grant work on our state and federal level. I will tell you there's a lot of work involved. It's, it's like any federal or state related uh, grant application. It's a give yourself a good six weeks before it's due. That's just just a little tip there, but um, you know we have been fortunate here at Arts and Letters Radio to build a partnership with our regional humanities council. So uh, they have been funding us for several years now, and we have a wonderful exchange and partnership with them on bringing, especially southern rural humanities work, to a broad audience, uh, which is a gap that we feel exists in a lot of public radio broadcast and podcasting. So uh, that's kind of our little niche. We look at, at capitalizing on rural voices. You can also, of course, look at various foundations that fund public media, journalism. There's a lot of uh, funding available for certain um, projects in journalism or um, uh, nonfiction podcasting that follow certain journalistic principles and ethics. So there is funding also available in, in that niche. So anyone else have grant suggestions or some search suggestions? Of course, CPB is also one too. CPB does offer programs. But again, many of those you have to be either a nonprofit or you have to be affiliated with a higher education institution. So just some things to think about for federal and state grant money. Um, those are the, the two key things. You either have to be your own 501c3 nonprofit uh, which is fairly easy to set up, um, or uh, you need to be affiliated with an institution of higher learning. Anybody want to add to something about applying for grants? Has anyone else applied for grants or gotten funding through grant work? I had an opportunity in the past to receive a very small grant from my university 
that was a discretionary funding from parents of students and enrolled at the university. And this funding could be used for projects or performances or opportunities outside of the classroom and beyond the normal boundaries of what might be expected as a, the, the quote educational experience on a, a university uh, campus. So I used it to pay for uh, live performances to provide honorariums for the director and the actors associated with episodes of reimagined radio. Um, that's totally particular to my university, but there may be similar offbeat uh, funding opportunities that if you're associated with the university, you might inquire at the, uh, the development or the alumni organization offices to see if there are any discretionary fundings that uh, might be available for a project, which you would then need to argue will reach um, far more students or far more alums than normal channels might and provide some interesting new way of communicating the university experience to uh, people in all the lands, you know, outside the gates of the university. If I could just follow up on something John said, what, one thing that has recently happened with us is that people have contacted me and asked whether in association with applying for a more general humanities or social scientific grant, they can include a podcast component as the uh, outreach, outreach part. Because many grants have these, you know, you, you have to have some sort of outreach. And I, I've actually done these before. And so the commitment that we make to them is, is that if they do a project on X and they want to mount a podcast, then we will agree to publish that podcast on the New Books Network and then push it to our audience. And I think this is attractive to grant giving bodies. I mean, the, the network itself is pretty well known. And so this you know, gives them a little bit of a leg up because they have an instant outreach component. And so I, I know for a fact that we are just, there's a grant going forward in political science that has this outreach component. So they're gonna do some podcast episodes, we're gonna edit them for them, and then we're gonna mount it as a, as a podcast on the New Books Network and then push it to our audience, which gives them good numbers they can report back to the grant giving body. Uh, Claire, briefly, you put in chat about the Linguistic Society kind of call for proposals. Do you want to talk a little bit about that kind of grant and that opportunity? Oh, I have to be honest. Um, mainly I know about that because um, the person who got the grant emailed me to say, goodness me, look what happened. And we were so excited. Um, and I was absolutely stunned that there was um, a fund that did that. So the only context I can properly talk about is the UK one, which would be um, that there's a huge push in research funding here at the moment for engagement. I think in the US context, it's called outreach. It's, I think it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, it is the same thing. Um, yeah, and it's sort of making sure that wonderful, you did great science, but does the wider world know what their public taxpayer money actually funded? Um, so if for those who are in a UK context, um, if you are putting in grant applications, capitalizing on that engagement, capitalizing on that sort of wider distribution of knowledge is probably a really good way forward. Um, but I wish I could tell you more about the NEH grant. It, I was just, I remember reading that, just being like, that is the kind of magic that's just not gonna happen to me, but it was brilliant, it was so good. Um, real quick, I put two um, two uh, possible resources in chat. One is the PRX Podcast Garage. Um, they have an open call for podcast pitches for especially new and diverse and equitable voices. So uh, just something to think about. You can just Google PRX Garage and you can find their links. And another one is also Air Media. It's the Association for Independence in Radio. But uh, we're in a general sense, independent radio or podcast producers. And there are a lot of resources that's a part of per the professional organization of Air Media. So uh, they are always free. It doesn't cost anything to be part of their newsletter or distribution list, but they do frequently put out uh, grant opportunities, funding opportunities, and um, also jobs. So if your students are in podcasting or in audio narrative, uh, Air Media is my favorite go-to to help my students if they are looking for podcast or audio work. 
Um, there was one question, Chad, I wanted to address about does federal or state money help provide legitimacy when it comes to scholarship or academic credentials? And I will say it really does. Having the tagline at the beginning of our program that support for our program comes from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Arkansas Humanities Council really does help in some ways give our show that academic legitimacy. It is counted for my annual review in terms of my, I'm a producer. And, and I run a small one minute podcast where I'm the host on my own, but generally my work is in uh, as a producer and uh, my institution does give me credit for that on the scholarship creative works side. Um, I also do get credit for the grant work that I do. So every grant that I write and I get funded, I also, it's kind of like a win-win there. I get credit for the grant in terms of academics. And then I do get credit for the um, production every time an episode is released. Um, so those were some really good questions. Um, oh, someone also just put the chat for uh, the PRX Podcast Garage. Um, that is a really good resource. One thing we haven't talked much about is actual production cost. So uh, maybe we could each talk about the average cost per season or per episode. Um, our, our program runs on a budget of about $15,000 a year. Um, and that mostly pays for the licensing for music across all digital platforms, broadcast and podcast, because they are separate licensing. And it pays for our professional sound mix and mastering, in a sense, the sound engineering. Um, so uh, that's pretty much how much we spend. And again, we get that funding through grants, but could some of us maybe each talk a little bit about the average cost of what we spend? So per episode, we're spending between um, $800 and $1,200. Um, and then again, that 15,000 plus per season. So maybe could some of you add what your production costs are? I know, John, you talked a little bit about that. Uh, yes, I I can't uh, give you a per episode um, cost because frankly it ranges wildly from episode to episode, depending on the production. Uh, for example, the upcoming episode uh, which will drop on the 18th of this month, the War of the Worlds, uh, is a ground up reimagination of that uh, radio drama and included in the price that I'm paying for that production is uh, the creation of new and original music, the creation of new and original sound effects, sound ambiences, sound design, post-production, as well as honorariums for the actors that were involved um, in the production. November's episode is just done, uh, it's a tribute uh, to uh, Candy Matson, the best of the female detective series of the uh, 40s and 50s. And I'm doing most of the production on that myself using public domain materials, editing them into a uh, story and then speaking the host bits and uh, then just turning it over for post-production. So cost will be uh, much less uh, for that. So that's a lot just to say my costs are not stable. They're varied and they depend on the production time, effort and value associated with individual episodes. Chris? Yeah, so along with production costs, let me mention real quick um, startup costs because I know we mentioned that in the beginning. So again, we're hearing some fantastic things here, John. The stuff you're doing sounds absolutely amazing. Um, but when you're when you're just starting out and you just want to get a podcast out there, I'm going to go ahead and say again, you don't have to buy a thousand dollars or twelve thousand dollars worth of equipment in order to get started. I always recommend, and I get no affiliation for this. I recommend an ATR 2100 or a, I think it's a QE 20 or whatever. But the ATR 2100 you can get for like like 70 bucks, it'll plug right into your laptop. And it's a half decent mic for doing that kind of thing. Get a comfortable pair of headphones and, you know, do everything else as, as efficiently as you can and ramp up if you can later on. The APN, as I said, we're doing, you know, small compared to some of these guys, but we're doing about a million downloads a year. And uh, we're producing 20 to 25 episodes a month across a number of different shows. Now, the editing is done by volunteers, including myself. So the editing is not being charged for. However, if you're looking at a per episode cost, 
when I charge my clients through my other system, I charge $50 an hour for all costs. And that's including editing, any sort of production, posting, any other things I'm doing for them. Um, it's $50 an hour. So if you look at our APN shows, they're all about an hour long. Editing takes, you know, recording takes about an hour and a half sometimes, but they're usually pretty straightforward with three segments. And editing takes, for me to do it, it's about a 2.5 multiplier because I'm really fast at it. And we're pretty detailed on the editing, but also really fast, but we're not doing any sound design. We're not doing all of that other stuff. We're just simply editing for clarity and content and making it flow. But I've done the cost before, including paying for our hosting, paying for our website, paying for Adobe Audition license. We use Zencaster to record remotely, paying for all those things. It ends up being about $250 or so per episode if you weren't, if you, if somebody was actually getting paid to do this, <laughs> our real costs per episode are probably somewhere around 10 or $12. Those are actual costs uh, when you, when you take everything down. But if we actually had the ability to pay everybody, then we'd be a lot higher. So that's where we're at. So I'm just saying, get into podcasting any way you can. <laughs> yeah, Charles, you've, we, we talked a little bit about this before, Charles, about how it doesn't take a lot to start or start up costs. It doesn't take as much as some folks imagine. Um, so, cause would you talk a little bit about that too for us, Charles? Charles can't hear you, I think. Can you hear me, Charles? Yeah, I put in the chat, I made like 37, started, I think I started with like, for like $37. So I don't really have a whole lot to add here, to be honest with you. Uh, my, I don't, in terms of like how much it costs to make an episode, the first thing that came to my mind was time. And that's important, right? Our time is important and it's valuable, but in terms of a financial or quantitative figure, I'm just out here in theoretical world thinking about time. Well, um, I, let's see, El, Elmira just uh, mentioned in chat, even using the free program Audacity is really good for recording. When we teach podcasting, that's what we recommend our students use. It's a great kind of intro level software. You don't need the thousand dollar plus annual subscription for certain kinds of production software to create a decent, good podcast. So that's just something to keep in mind. And two, I guess, some you know general startup costs can be as little as that 37 to about two I, we recommend to our students if they want to start a podcast it's about a 200 dollars investment in terms of a decent mic which is you know anywhere between 60 and 100 dollars um to a good pair of headphones and the free audacity program and a lot of software platforms like um they don't cost anything to upload your content to so uh just Keep in mind, uh, there is those options. Excellent. Okay, we have uh, a few more minutes from some questions. Oh, one about questions about making money, and um, you know, in terms of turning this work into something that makes a living through podcasting. Um, one of our uh, Milan mentions it seems tantalizing but hard to achieve. I will tell you, we do not make any personal money from our program. Um, we, the most we could do because we are university employees is summer salary, which we have never done. We have foregone uh, that idea to instead pay for music. So, um, you know, we don't actually get paid to do the work, but then we also receive, I also receive the academic credit for it. So I guess there's a balance there. You know, we don't get paid for academic peer reviewed journal articles either. So, um, per se. So just, you know, some good things to think about. What do you guys think as a panel about the issue of being paid, kind of doing this for a living versus doing it for the scholarship or the, uh, you know, academic public humanities? I've made my living for a number of years as an academic, and I think lots of you will know that doesn't mean that I'm bringing in a huge amount of income. Um, I think there's a, a higher calling, um, and if we can advance knowledge or share uh, literary experiences uh, through this new medium of podcasting, uh, to me, the opportunity to explore those opportunities is more than worthwhile. I, I don't think it's an either-or proposition. I mean, I think we all are on the same team, and we have the same mission, and in one way or another, that's public education. We hope to attract audiences and then teach them something because we think 
that we or the people that we talk to have something to impart. And so the question mm -hmm. is how to best do that. And there are lots of ways to do it. Um, and it really depends on what the podcaster kind of is thinking about when they do the podcast. If it's a kind of a side gig and you have a job as a tenured professor or something, that's one thing. Um, but you know, for the New Books Network, I mean, we're a business. Uh, in order to continue to do what we do and really pursue our mission, which is public education, we have to have the revenue to do that. And so you have to make some hard choices about you know, how you're going to go about doing that. Um, but it, uh, you know, no enterprise, no project, no anything is sustainable unless it can pay for itself. You can only live for so long on enthusiasm, which is great. But at, at the end of the day, you're going to have to think, well, how do I continue to do the work that I want to do? And, and that again, you know, then you have to ask a different set of questions, um, which I learned, in, <laughs> I learned in a very hard way <laughs> for many years. Okay, we have about six minutes left. So um, I thought um, just to wrap up some of the things we've talked about today, of course, we've talked about production costs. We've talked about, we've not really talked a lot about licensing, but if anyone has any last minute questions on licensing or platform hosting, we could talk about that. We have talked a little bit about monetizing and commercials and some nonprofit versus for-profit issues. Um, so I would like to take this time to ask each panelist to give us kind of a big uh, final takeaway to help us in our journey of making humanities podcasts. Marshall? Oh, <laughs> I yeah, agree yeah, with Chris first. that you should get out there and make a podcast. That's great because, mm -hmm. you know, always, yeah, I, I do think that we're all on the same team here and we do all have the same mission and that is public education. And so it doesn't cost very much to start. Of course, eventually, if you really want to do it for a long time and you want to create an institution rather than a podcast, then you're going to have to think about, well, how do I get the revenue which is necessary to continue to do this? And then you're going to have to think about money. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing because sustainable enterprises, including podcasts, have the money that they need in order to continue to do their good work. So this is a, you know, this is a serious consideration and a good consideration. So if any of the audience wants to talk to me about it, I'm, I'm very happy to talk to them. Claire? Um, it's come up a few times, but I think what I would probably say is if you're in this to get super mega rich really quickly, this is probably not <laughs> the fastest way to achieve that outcome. Um, but what I would also say is, yes, you can make monetary income from this, but also don't underestimate the other really surprising things that can happen. Um, so I've had emails from, I mean, I'm not going to list anyone because it, it's weirdly braggy anyway, but I've had emails from very surprising people who have suddenly popped into my inbox and said, oh, I listened to this episode. Fantastic. Can we talk about X? And then amazing opportunities have opened up off of the back of that. So not all of the income has to be this sort of substantive, you know, shiny gold coins of the realm. Um, but I would say if if you're kind of only doing it in a very instrumental way, you know, um, I just rather than having a real passion for it and a real interest in it, or if you're only in it purely to get really rich really fast, this might not be the best for you. If you love it and if you won't be sad, if you only have a small, really hardcore niche of followers rather than millions, this is brilliant. It's really lovely. It's very fulfilling. I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it and I've spent very little on it as, as you've seen. John? Well, uh, good points have been made uh, both by Claire and, uh, and Marshall, so I'll sound a bit like an echo chamber, but I think that um, if you want to make a podcast, make a podcast, figure out a, a way to do it. And lots of great suggestions have been offered and uh, lots of encouragement to move forward. I very much like Claire's point that you never know what's going to happen. You make something, you put it out there, and you, you have no idea who's going to end up listening to it. Um, I mean, I got a call from This American Life that wanted to talk about uh, what I had done. Totally out of the blue and very much surprised about it. So um, 
I realize it's one thing to say, make a podcast and put it out there when there's about 15 billion podcasts that are available for people to listen to. The question really is how do, how do you make yours end up on the first page of search results? And we've talked about some efforts to do that. Well, you know, that means you've, you've got to keep working. Uh, and so podcasting to me anyway, is never done. It's always a process of becoming, and you should always be working on and thinking about what's next. You know, what am I going to do for the next episode? How am I going to move forward and find a way to do it? To, you know, despite the, the difficulties, I haven't had to sell the family silver yet. <laughs> I have, um, I have sold some other items that I felt like I had no longer any use for, and that those resources could be redistributed and reapplied toward uh, toward my podcast. So you know, it's an innovative media. There are innovative approaches, and there should be innovative responses to the challenges of taking it on. And, Chris, uh, so this has been oh, a great. I'm sorry. Experience. No, I'm done. Sorry, <laughs> Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Real quick, all good points. Um, I've got this background up because my yacht doesn't have a good background for, you know, uh, Zoom calls. So apologies for that. I wanted to show you guys, but anyway, uh, yeah, just again, get started. Minimal gear. You don't even need a microphone. I mean, if you can get a microphone, get a microphone. But your content is going to win out overall. If you've got an idea, the biggest thing is fleshing out that idea. Don't think I think this would be a great podcast. Take your timer on your phone, set it for three minutes. And if you can't write down your first 10 episode ideas in three minutes, you need to think about it some more. Otherwise, you'll pod fade after four or five episodes and it'll be all a waste of time. The other biggest piece of advice, put it on your calendar, all the pieces associated with it and plan for an hour podcast, a good five to six hours of research and um, everything else. So Charles, close us out. Okay, I want to. I'll talk about um, something that's and completely different, and that's the relationship between monetization and community. Okay, so like, podcasters are a community, and I'm not gonna get on this like emo spill here, but like, <laughs> join the community, right? To find the different people doing this work. I know Marshall. I know John, Chris, Claire, and and and, and me now, right? Like, get in there, and when you make your first episode, I think Chris gives really good advice in terms of like make sure you have like 10 of them, right? Find the way to fill the gap. And I hate that language, but there's just no way be better way to say it. What are you going to contribute to the conversation, to the community that fills the gap and benefits the community? And then maybe that's one way that you could turn in and get monetized. The other thing I'll say is to have better internet than I had today. So, <laughs> Marshall, Chris, Claire, <laughs> Charles, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone who joined us today. We really appreciate it. Hopefully, we'll see you next year. All right. Thank Thanks, you all guys. very much. Goodbye, thank you, everyone. Bye, thank everybody. You. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.